19 years old, back injury, off work for six months. Three years later, almost a $3 million in revenue business. Recurring Where is revenue. this guy gonna be in three years when he's 25? Just to give you context, I'm the youngest in my company. You literally dawned on $2.8 million into your bank account. Just stop and think about that for a second. That is freaking amazing to me. Not many 22 year olds are looking at setting up a cleaning business. It doesn't cost much, all you need is a mop, a vacuum. It's an ugly, not fancy, non-sexy. I just thought, what's the worst that can happen? God damn. Yeah. Like that's heavy. I listen to this and I go, as far as entrepreneurship goes, we are born in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory of marbles. You did it! You did it! You get to the point where you trying to scale and trying to maintain that service. And the number one thing that it comes back to always is Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Unemployable. This week is going to be an absolute cracker. We've got a superstar guest in with us this morning. And uh, first of all, as always, checking in with the boys. Mark, how are you, buddy? Good to have you back on the desk. Yeah, yeah. So good to be back on the GC. Missed the last couple, but we're, we're back. Yes. How are you enjoying all this sunshine we're getting? It's beautiful. Yeah. It, it only finally just got warm in Melbourne. I don't know. Summer starts in February these days. <laughs> um, but yeah, here, here it's beautiful and the sun comes up so bright and early. JD, what is going on? Oh, mate, couldn't be better. Couldn't be better. Uh, looking forward to ripping out this one. It's a, uh, a unique one. It's a... Uh, um, uh, an industry that um, probably is hard to disrupt and um, young Zeke is doing a great job at it. So we're keen to pull the uh, cover back and have a look at that. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, is our guest today, Zeke Galloway. How are you, Zeke? Yeah, very good. Very yeah. good. Good to be here. Lovely to have you with us, mate. We'll get into your story in a minute. We cannot wait. Yep. And of course, the one and only Mr. Eric Machado. How are you, brother? I'm very good, man. Yeah. I'm very good. How are you? Oh, I'm very happy you've <laughs> once again worn your uh, sports shorts <laughs> to show off the goodies for us. Sports. <laughs> sp sp sports <laughs> shorts. Oh, let me get my glasses. <laughs> 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 it's starting to become a real thing. You need, you need a little, uh, little modesty towel over there, Adam. I know, just, it's just, just a toss on the uh, human tent. So, uh, tell me, how are you? I think uh, it's a big week for you this week. Dude, I know. It's for those who are wondering what Eric's talking about. It is the big five zero for me on the weekend. Wow! Can you explain five zero? Comes out. What yes, is five zero? Fifty. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, 50. So by the time this comes out next week, I'll actually be 50 years old. Wow. Yeah. So what's uh, what's first on the list when you hit 50? Uh, as far as the uh, nip tuck, have you got the Ricky Gervais, <laughs> have you got, have you got the Ricky Gervais special that need a bit of a trip, a bit of a lift? <laughs> what? Uh, no, the, what, there's, I'm not at the Ricky Gervais level. Yet. Because um, gra yes. gravity's a bitch, let's just be yes. clear. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think we'll go into explaining what Ricky's uh, comments are there, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's certainly an interesting time in life, you know, like I was just thinking about it, obviously leading up this week, quite a bit actually for the last few months, if I'm honest, but it's quite a reflective time when you come up to 50, it's one of the biggest birthdays. I look at young Z here and I remember when I was, how old are you, Matt? 22. 22. God damn. Uh, I, remember, I remember being 22, you know, and being ambitious and starting my first companies, and it, it really goes really, really quick. Do you actually remember it, though? <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's changed, Adam? Still ambitious, still starting companies? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think, um, for, for, you, to, for the record, yes, Eric, I, I do remember being 22. Um, but um, I think, you know, heading into your 50th, your, your values um, and your priorities certain, certainly do shift, um, especially... W when you've been in business for, since I was a little bit younger than you, since I was 19, so 30 years of business, 31 years of being self-employed um, coming up this year. But um, yeah, I think the big things are certainly around uh, health and, um, mm. and, and being determined. I think I've resigned myself to the fact that I'll always be doing something in business. Mm. And the big realization is making sure that I have more fun than what I've had in the last 30. I've had fun, but trying to just do it with a bit more ease and effort. And this is just getting way too sentimental for me. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, one of the things uh, I heard is the best thing I heard about being 50 is that you get great at multitasking. <laughs> You can laugh, cough, fart, and pee all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, you actually don't look 50 from a distance, eh? <laughs> hey, Eric. Do you uh, want to borrow these? <laughs> <laughs> all right, moving on from the 50th. Great to be here. And, and, you know, I feel very, very blessed to be here at this time of life. You don't know how long you got. Uh, one, one thing. What, what would you, if you could go back and tell your 22-year-old self something, what, what would you tell it? Oh, look, I don't know. If, you know, sometimes I, my, my initial answer used to be, oh, it's all going to be all right. But I think if I told him that, he'd probably take the foot off the gas. So mm. I don't think I'd change too much, you know. Um, 
yeah, I, I, I'm happy I've had all the experiences I've had. And um, it, yeah, it all leads to where you are today. So um, yeah, no, no regrets. And, nice. Yeah. So uh, one thing we wanted to announce this morning before we jump in, we have a <coughs> new sponsor for the pod as of today. And uh, we are ripping the shirts here, Eric and I, boom, with the hats and everything. Early Bird AI. It's a good, fun little story, actually, about these guys. Um, you know, some of you might remember one of the earlier pods we did when we had Chris Jeong in the house here talking about artificial intelligence. And we were so blown away and, and pumped by that pod that we, um, we met with Chris afterwards and said, mate, if you ever want to do anything, we'd love to get involved with you in the AI space. And Early Bird is the result of um, that uh, discussion. Right. Uh, we actually partnered, Chris, with one of the young men in our coaching program who's also 22 years old. Is he 22? He is. He's 22. So we put the two of them together, and Eric and I have funded them. We've just opened um, space down uh, next to the Porsche Centre uh, here on the Gold Coast near Ferry Road Market. It's got a beautiful facility there, um, and they are ready uh, to go. So we are now announcing that they are a sponsor of the pod uh, because we're too small uh, at the moment to actually get people to pay us. So we, <laughs> we, will, we will basically get uh, companies that we own to sponsor us. <laughs> it's called Rob, Rob and Peter to pay Paul. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, uh, we're really excited. So, Eric, just in a few words, before we jump into the pod, what does Early Bird AI do and why did we back these guys? And for the listeners, why should they go over there and check them out? Yeah, so Early Bird AI basically is bridging the gap with this overwhelming topic of AI and business and how people can implement it in their businesses. I mean, it's still an overwhelming topic for me. Um, I'm learning about AI now on a daily basis, surrounding myself with Chris and Sam and Adam having multiple meetings every day. And honestly, Chris and Adam are, are two young, very, very Sam. intel. Uh, sorry, um, Chris and Sam are just two young, um, very intelligent guys. To be honest with you, Sam pulled up his computer yesterday, and the way his organization just on his desktop was, I was blown away. I'm like, Adam, do you do this? He goes, actually, no, neither do I. I'm like, we need, we need a session. You're 50 for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we felt old. Yeah. But essentially what, what they're doing, guys, and you've had a one-on-one -on -one with them, James, in your business with your healthcare company, mm -hmm. they will sit down with any business owner um, and do an audit. So they'll sit down and listen for half an hour to 45 minutes, learn everything there is about your business, and they have a suite of AI tools that they are masters at, and they'll give you a proposal to actually build and implement them in your business. And the reason we're so excited about this um, from the place of unemployable media is unemployable is about the little guy having a crack and we think right now, with the emergence of AI, we see this as a, an opportunity for small guys to take on and even surpass the big guys who are traditionally really slow to embrace new technology. And the stuff that these AIs, that these guys have uh, got their arms around, the stuff that they can do for all kinds of businesses. We've seen them audit everything from James's healthcare company. We've had them in on a guy who's got a pergola business in Sydney. We've got a, an accommodation business here on the Gold Coast. Already they've got like five clients and they haven't even started. Um, the sign-up rate so far has been almost 100% from the people who've seen what the services are to signing up with wow. them to get them to implement it. Um, so if you want to go and learn about what Early Bird are doing, if you're an online seller, absolutely powerful applications. If you're an Amazon seller, Shopify seller, just about any industry, go to earlybird.ai and it's E-A-R-L-I, not Y. So earlybird.ai. Set yourself up a free meeting with Chris and Sam and just go um, hear them out. James? Effective. If you've got a website, um, they're in, your, in the crosshairs. So, yeah, you know, if you have a website, honestly, yeah, the, full the things stop. that they can automate to, uh, in terms of processes, but not just automate and save time, but actually make real money on autopilot, it's mind-blowing. So um, that's a, a genuine endorsement as any, entrepreneurs. Any of the people that I've referred already, you know, I've gotten messages just being blown away from that initial discovery call. So yep. great feedback already. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, the uh, other thing we want to uh, talk about just quickly before we jump into Zeke's incredible story is uh, on May 13th to May 16th, um, I am going to be going to uh, Indonesia. I'm going to Bali. Um, and I'm going up there with anybody who wants to contribute to the charity that we are supporting up there, which is the John Fawcett Foundation. My wife runs our family office nonprofit, which is loveheart.org, loveheart.org. Um, we take a busload of people. There are, I think, 22 seats on the bus, 
and I will be on the bus for three days. Well, not on the bus, but on the bus. And then the village, we go over to Java and we are sponsoring an entire village um, to get free eye surgery. So on average, the money that is raised from that bus uh, uh, gets 3,000 free um, eye examinations done. We have doctors and nurses and the mobile hospitals there. And then uh, usually two to 300 blind people will walk out of that um, three or four days that we are there with their vision back. And you will actually get to travel with me from Bali. We go across Bali on a bus, then we jump on a ferry, go over the Javanese straight into Java. And then we put you up in a hotel, all the food's included, um, and we hang out for two days at the village. And you'll get to participate in those surgeries, but to sit there with somebody who's getting their vision restored, and you'll actually see a miracle happen in real life. And inside a secret, most of those 22 people on the bus are hardcore entrepreneurs mm. that have the time and funds to be able to do this. So it's an incredible opportunity to network with you know, charity-minded, usually successful entrepreneurs. So there's only 22 seats. It's $2,050, which includes pickup in Bali, uh, the bus, all your food, the hotel over in Java, and three days together. Um, and all of that money, aside from the cost of the hotel and the food, goes directly to the village. Um, so if you want to join me, my wife, and 22 other awesome people, go to loveheart.org. Uh, as quickly as possible because this bus will fill every time I go it fills. Mark you've been yeah I was just going to say it's an, an incredible experience um, if you've had a little bit of success in business and you're looking to pay something forward it's it's a great human experience or if you if you're feeling a little bit stressed and run down from business and you're looking to balance back um, you know getting get just seeing the impact that you're you're you know, for, for us, $1,000, $2,000, it's, it's not a great deal in, in, in a country like Australia. But for them, you're literally changing their lives because you're, you're giving them ability to work again, um, to see their family again, literally, quite literally. So, yeah, it's an incredible experience and you'll have an awesome time with the people that you're on the bus with because everyone's in that same uh, mindset and frame of mind. So mm -hmm. it's really good. Well, thank you for the endorsement, Mark. And it's, it's a piece of work that I've been doing now for many years. We've done thousands of eye surgeries now and... I, I can't encourage you enough. If you feel it when you're listening to this right now and you just need to shake things up and just have a break from the intensity of Western life, come. Yep. Just find the money and come and give uh, because I promise you it will change your life. It is yep. one of those things that when you see it, you can't unsee it and it will forever change the way that you look at the world. And, and you'll feel wealthy in ways that you never dreamed possible. Yeah, that's actually a really beautifully put. So... To today's guest, today we have Zeke Galloway, who has so far been sitting there very quietly. Yes. But uh, this young man has an epic, epic story that I know all of our listeners are going to love, particularly the young people listening to this who are sitting there going, how do I get ahead? House prices are so high. Interest rates have been keeping me out of the market. And then we see a guy like you who comes along, does something that most young people would never consider doing, um, and you're just absolutely smashing it. So Zeke, what's the headline of your story? Okay, so my name's Zeke. I'm the founder and managing director of Do Era Cleaning. Um, and we've grown from just a small startup now to um, a company with over 2.8 or 2.8 in recurring um, annual contracts. Okay, so you started $2.8 million in annual recurring contracts. And when did you start? Uh, just under two years ago. That's incredible. So in under two years from zero to 2.8 million in recurring contracts. Now, what was the name of the company? It was New Era Cleaning, New right? Era Cleaning, yep. yeah. Yeah, ERA, New yep. Era Cleaning. Yep. So congratulations on that. That's incredible. Yeah, thank you. So tell us, Zeke, where are you from? What's your family background? Where did you begin? Yeah, so I grew up um, on the Central Coast, which is about an hour north of Sydney. And I grew up, you know, just a middle-class family. Um, my mum owned a pub, or my pop bought a pub actually in the 80s. So I grew up um, in that hospitality scene, you know, from like a young kid, I was always in and around the pub, you know, seeing that side of the business. So I think that molded me in a lot of ways. Um, but from there, uh, you know, I grew up quite a normal life. I, I was a bit of a, a troublesome kid, actually. I got <laughs> was in and out of trouble a fair bit. Um, and yeah, I, I ended up leaving school when I was 15. Um, and I pursued a trade. I did about every trade you could imagine under the sun. <laughs> I did um, all of them and you know, I just never, I never liked any of them. I used to just 
look at my life and I used to think like I'd see the people around me and I'd think you know this isn't how I want to live my life you know and um and then by the age of I think 20 it was uh, yeah I was 19 and I injured my back um and it put me out of work for about six months and I came to this decision afterwards and I was like you know I had this injured back I couldn't go back to at the time I was doing roofing so I couldn't go back to being a roofer um you know because of my back injury and this time it would healed a bit uh, so I decided that I was going to go work in the family business. Um, much to my dismay, I didn't really want to, but um, it was it was my only option. So from there, I think that that is where I really started to mould into the person that I am today. You know, I cleaned up my act, stopped um, partying as much, and you know, kind of got my act together. And um, and yeah, and while I was working in the family business, I was there for about five months. Uh, my uncle. He um, was really heavily into real estate and property, property. Um, and he kind of introduced me to the business world and, and real estate world, um, which I just fell in love with. And since basically that introduction to it all, I just became obsessed, um, stopped partying, stopped drinking, you know, just went all in basically. Um, I'm interested yeah, yeah. to hear about that intervention a little bit because yeah, yeah. there are going to be young people listening to this as well as older people um, how did your uncle actually have that conversation? So there's this one guy yeah. who says, hey, Zeke, look at this, and that changed your, the trajectory of your life, really. So can you take us to that discussion? Like, what was going on in your life? What, 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 how did that unfold? Because this is a really critical yeah. moment in your life, yeah. and, and I, I want older people listening to this to understand the impact yeah. of <clears throat> one conversation to the right person at the right time. Yeah, yeah. Well, me and my uncle... Uh, to give a little bit more context, growing up, we didn't have the best relationship, you know, because I was such a naughty kid, you know, I used to just think I was a little shit, basically. And then I, um, and then, but it was when we got to, when I started working in the pub, we started to build this relationship. And um, I had a little bit of money saved at the time from w when I was working um, in the trade. And he, he basically was telling me about these real estate deals that he's doing. He owned a bit of property um, in Logan up here. And um, he kind of, was just showing me it. You know, I don't remember a specific conversation where he was like, look, you need to basically pull your life together, but just him introducing me to it and just giving me that bit of base um, and understanding. Um, he gave me a couple books to read, which really helped. And then- um, What were the books? So one, one was a Don <gasps> book. Mm -hmm. um, Art of the Deal. The Art of the Deal. Yeah, yeah. Such a good book. Such yeah, a good book. Yeah. And then another couple I just read on my own. Uh, there's an Australian guy that did one. I can't remember his name. Also, Eddie Deline. There's another one. Um, 30 Properties by 30, I think. So, so a couple of books were yeah, given to you. Yeah. And he talked to you about some deals that he was doing. Yeah, yeah. And that inspired you. And when you heard that, did that resonate with you the first time you heard that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. And, I, and the thing is, I'd never read like a proper book in my life till I was 20 years old. Like I think in school I would just skim them basically. So I, um, and I just became obsessed with reading. I just started reading a book every week. Um, and How many, I mean, you're, you're the same, James, like I've heard you say this. And yeah. also, um, Tim from, uh, yeah. we had on here last week, he's the same thing, and he read one, didn't read a book through going through school. Same picked as up, Eric. Same as, with the yeah, ice Eric, baths. Exactly. It's a, a very um, common theme coming through here. It's a bit of a late bloomers on the books, but then as soon as they get their hands on them, they can't put them down, and mm. here's the result. So yeah. all of you people listening to this, that your parents describe you as little shits, there's hope for you. <laughs> That's exactly right. We've had a few little yeah. shits sit in this chair that have done very, very well. <laughs> yeah. Seems yeah. to be a common, <laughs> seems to be a common trait. Yeah. <laughs> little, little shit corner. Yeah. So you got this. Yeah. You got this one crazy uncle who's been tolerating with your um, naughty little butt for a while, and then he's finally said to you, "Dude, have a look at this," and and then you started to click into gear. Now, who, whose idea was it to go into cleaning? And this is one of the reasons we wanted to get you on the pod yep. was because a lot of young people today want to be OnlyFans managers or they want to be OnlyFans <laughs> girls or they want to start the next early bird AI because it's new and trendy. Mm. But here you are rolling up your sleeves and going and cleaning toilets and doing exit cleans and restaurants and stuff like that, I imagine. What was the mentality? How did you... What was going on in your head to do that? Because that's uncommon for a mm -hmm. young person. Mm. Well, I guess when I think back on it, like in hindsight, it probably wasn't the most thought out logical decision. Like I wasn't thinking like, oh, I'm going to come in and revolutionize the cleaning space. It was more just, you know, I 
so if we go back to the thing with my uncle, like I got into real estate, then that le- ended up leading to business. And then from there, I moved uh, with my partner, Pan, to um, the Gold Coast. And at this time, when I was dabbling in the real estate, I'd tried, to, tried a couple online businesses, um, just some drop shipping stuff and nothing worked. And then it was right at the time when we had moved up here, I was working in a sales job and I was just looking at different businesses and I thought, Cleaning is a business that you don't need a lot of startup costs, right? It doesn't cost much. All you need is a mop, a vacuum, and, you know, a couple of cleaning chemicals. And I just thought, you know, what's the worst that can happen? You know, I start it and then, uh, you know, it fails and I haven't put much money and I'm not in debt. You know what I mean? And then... It is, pre- it is a pretty logical way to look at it. It like is, the, the, yeah. The, the, and then, but then, it's always going to be needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And if you look yeah. at, um, follow the big guy, Alex Hermosi, he actually did a, a case study on this specifically to show young people what the best first business would be. It would be services-based business. And he created a, a, a mock business called Alex Trash. And he went through the, the whole thing and mm. created, uh, did you see that? I saw that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. it's a, a, a good so look. That's a hyper-logical approach. That, that's, in, that's incredible yeah. insight because so many people are like, oh, I want to do e-commerce and, and whatnot. Because it, like you said, it's, it's, the it's, in thing, it's the in thing. But those businesses can be so capital intensive, especially when you're growing. And I'm, I'm mm. sure cleaning is as well. But like you said, you can start with a mop and a bucket. Yeah, exactly. And I think that um, it was only, like, and it, the thing is, it was only up until like I actually started the business a couple months in even like six months in and I really saw the market gap and then that's when our business exploded. But like before then, I just thought, you know, like it's an old industry been around for thousands of years and if I can improve on it, then... What was that market gap that you you, you, um, you talk of? Um... Yeah. So I think that there's a massive need for cleaning services. Um, And like I said, it took me like six months to really realise it. But there's like, there's such a big gap between, um, you know, what people want and where the companies are at like there's in the cleaning space there's a mix of two types of companies so there's either like you've got like your small like mum and pop type businesses that just do the cleaning themselves or you've got like these super big companies and a lot of the time their service is is just not the best and so we came in at this point or I came in at this point after COVID and I saw you know that people were struggling for cleaners and I just saw all these big companies were just not providing the best service. So we just came in and just went hard for like eight to 12 months and grew so really let's, quickly. So let's just drill yeah. into that a little bit. So when you say these companies, who is who is the customer here? Are you commercial cleaning or are you residential cleaning or are you both? Where did you see the gap? And when you say they weren't providing the service, how would that show up from a customer point of view? How would you describe a bad experience in the context of that customer? Yeah, yeah. So we do commercial cleaning services to answer um, that question. So restaurants, yeah. offices, things like that? Yeah, we do a lot of um, hospitality. So okay. anyone on the Gold Coast knows like Cali Beach Club, yeah. um, Generic Group. Genari so Group. We do a lot of those types of venues. Um, but a lot of the bigger companies, what, what, I th- what happens and I've noticed is a trend and what we're trying to avoid now is like the companies get to this point where they're so big Um, it's like this inflection point and we're kind of at it now, I won't lie, is like you get to the point where you, you're trying to scale and trying to maintain that service. And the number one thing that it comes back to always is competing on price and the cleaning industry, especially commercial cleaning, everyone just competes on price. But Mm -hmm. what happens is when you compete on price, you then have to, you, then you're competing on the margin that you're allocating to provide the service, right? So it's like this endless cycle. You compete on price and then you don't have enough resources to then provide the service. So then you lose customers, they churn out, then you have to compete on price again. And that's what that's what happens to these big companies. Especially because yeah. it's quite an unsophisticated business. Like you said, anyone yeah. with a bu- bucket and a mop can feasibly do it. Exactly. So they come in from day one and just start undercutting price. And that's the same with like painting, for example. I've got a friend uh, and client who's got a big painting business and it's the same issue because you don't need to be that qualified. You're roll the paint on that. Yeah. Do, yeah. Um, do you have an issue with with or I, I, with cleaning? Do, do the businesses see it? They, they don't see it as an investment. They see it as an expense. Does that create a bit of a problem? Like, Yeah, do, it, it definitely can, yeah. We yeah. notice that. And do you notice sometimes that they don't value the service as much as you would want them to? Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it's understandable, you know, they... Yeah. They've got, at the end of the day, they've got to try and cut costs where they can. And cleaning is usually a big expense, you know. So talking about, um, just drilling it out again. So I own a restaurant. 
uh, I'm frustrated with my cleaner because the gap is not being met. So what, what does that mean? The place isn't as clean as it should be, the cleaners are not turning up on time. Is that basically it? Yeah, yeah. And, and if you own a restaurant, right, your restaurant's open seven days, so you have cleaners basically every day coming in there. So, um, you know, there couldn't be issues where they'll change a cleaner um, and then one night might not be as good as the other, you know, and just overall consistency mainly. So training is a big part of what you're doing, right? Yeah, and, and, and like really making sure. So, okay, so let, before we jump too much into the strategy, day one, you decide, all right, Pan, let's start this business, right? And is, does, Pan's here in the studio. Do, do you guys work together at the start or she runs all the socials, I know, now? So Pan only just started working with me like a couple months ago. But, okay. she, but she's been the, um, the, she's done a lot of the behind the scenes emotional consoling, I would say. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> chief consoling officer. <laughs> chief, chief consoling officer. So, yeah. So CCO. Yeah. CCO, that's yeah, her. CCO. Yeah. We all need yeah. one of those. Yeah, in life, yeah. a good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so you started off and you go, you have this idea, literally day one. Yeah. You got no money, I assume. Or mm -hmm. did you start with money or no money? No money. No. no money. So how did you get your first customer? So originally, like I was working in sales and I, I was doing telesales and I hated it. And then uh, one day I just, I was sitting there and I, I said to Pan, I'm just going to quit and I'm just going to start. And then um, I thought, okay, that might not be the best decision. Let me try and get my first customer first at least. So <laughs> I was working in telesales. So I had this big list of, um, or sorry, I had these skills that I, that I developed through telesales, right? I thought, why don't I just gather this list and I'll just call or every business on there and try and get a walkthrough or a quote. And um, I had like 50, 50 numbers there, 50, uh, they were childcare centers. And I called 50 of them and I got one walkthrough. And then I was like, okay, this can maybe work. So then I quit my job and then <laughs> in telesales and then did the walkthrough. And then for the, first six, for, the, for the first nine months, I drove DoorDash on the side. So I was doing delivery driving just so we had enough money to nice. pay bills. And then I would do sales through the day, drive DoorDash at night. Sales through the day, drive DoorDash at night. And then on the weekends, I'd do DoorDash as well. So the sales through the day, sales for your cleaning business. Yeah. And that consists of just calling. Yeah. That, or, and doing, doing walk-ins. So like we'd have an hospitality venue. Um, first we'll call, get the decision maker's name. And then we'll, I'll walk in there and be like, oh, hey, do you go, would you like a quote or, you know. So he's walking in with a t-shirt on. With a button up, yeah. And, just, yeah. and so some of these contracts you've got, like Gennari Group and whatnot, I mean, they're, they're quite large um, uh, hoteliers or hospitality groups on, on the Gold Coast. And you're a 20-year-old kid at this point walking in, <laughs> yeah. and they've probably got nine different cleaning crews or one major. What are they, why, why you, mm -hmm. over a, an established cleaning company, they're going to give the contract to, to you that's not competing on price at yeah. this point? Feel, yeah. feel free to talk us through the sale, not, not your industry specific techniques but the sales process and what what tips you can yeah yeah well i think that like a, a big thing like going back to what you said james the that was a big kind of a, a big worry for me because i thought you know like people aren't going to take me seriously because i'm young you know what i mean like but like honestly it wasn't it wasn't like that at all if anything people were more inclined to go with us because the selling point was like we're the new era of cleaning you know <laughs> what i mean and i'm young you know and that's kind of where the name came from as well um, so, so that was a big, a big thing, but our sales process, we would, uh, we would try and be really thorough. Like, so it starts off, I can, I can give you the full layout if you want. So yeah. it starts off, like I said, as a, a cold call, um, we'll ask for the decision maker's name and then we would walk in there. I would walk in there and say, hi, you know, my name's Zeke. How's your cleaning going? And just chat with them. A lot of the time they would just brush you. And then, mm. so that's when you've got to go back in there and just build that relationship. A lot of it is just the relationship building type stuff. Um, and then from there, if they did want to do a quote, we would quote. And then a lot of people would quote and then just send them the proposal and forget about it. What I would do always do is I would do the quote and then organize a second meeting to come and present it to them. And then that's where I can really build value on our services and hopefully you know, get a start date locked in. So, I, I just want to, <laughs> I just want to highlight something here for people listening to this. Like, I'm looking down here at this smart company article, right? And I'm looking to my left and I see this guy who is 22 years old, left school at 15. This was 17 months ago. You went and door knocked 2.5 million, now $2.8 million worth of business 
that was sitting in the marketplace, you literally telephoned and door knocked $2.8 million into your bank account annually. Mm. I mean, just stop and think about that for a second. Mm. That is freaking amazing to me. Mm. In the Gold Coast, not, not all over the country, right? This is the Gold Coast. Gold Coast, Brisbane. Yeah. Gold Coast, Brisbane. Toowoomba. Yeah. Toowoomba. Yeah. It's incredible, especially for, for clean, a oh. cleaning business. That, it's so hard to disrupt. It's so hard to get in there and break their contracts and whatnot. People just it's incredible. fucking bitching all day long. Oh, it's too hard to... Uh, poor me. Fuck your poor me. Like, seriously, mm. I listen to this and I go... This is what I mean, why I go to Indonesia, for example, and join us for a tour, because all your bitching and moaning will stop when you realize that as far as entrepreneurship goes, we are born in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory of marbles. <laughs> like, <laughs> the opportunity here compared to the rest of the world is just bananas. Yeah. You needed no qualifications, you just needed the balls to front up and say, will you give me a crack? At cleaning your toilets and not being too fucking proud to do it. And, so and, well done, Zeke. Yeah, yeah. Well, and like also, yeah. I mean, the micro nuance in sales, which I love, sales processes and systems, is actually just going that little bit further and coming back with a proposal and sitting down and talking them through it, so you can get the fucking deal. And email doesn't work. Mm. Come back, talk them through it, build a rapport. Sign just here, and here's how you pay. Like yeah. just the old school direct response. Uh, oh, sorry, direct uh, direct response selling. Um, and um, yeah, it seems a lot of people have lost that uh, ability. A yeah. little bit further, you, you, you mentioned a little bit further. You, how many times have I had a tradesperson come give me a quote? Not give me a quote, actually. Come to the house or come to the commercial premises to look at the place to then give me a quote and never follow up with a fucking mm. quote. Mm. Correct. Yeah. Like, like honestly, fo- like I, I say this to our coaching clients all the time, like follow up, that, that, those two words, right? was everything for me when I was your age, Zeke, you know? Mm. And it looks like you're doing the same thing. I'm, I'm still yeah. just trying to comprehend 15 years old, left school. Mm. Yeah. 19 years old, back injury, off work for six months. Three years later, three million, almost a $3 million in revenue business. Like, where is Recur- this guy re- going to go? Recurring. 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 Where is revenue. this guy going to be <laughs> in three years when he's 25? I oh, know, that's what I keep You know, I'm like, like, all at the same time, Adam can be his grandfather. Like, I, <laughs> like it just boggles my mind. He already had a grandfather mentor. He's fine. He's good. He's good. They say, uh, what, 30 is the new 20, but it's more like 20 is the new 30 these days, just seeing what, what young kids are able yeah. to achieve. And I love the name when, when, when James is like, why you? And we have a, uh, an accommodation business, so I understand, you know, cleaners and the bottleneck of cleaners. And majority of, I, I think... When, when James asks why you is, it's refreshing to see a 22-year-old baby face professional mm. come to you, right, and actually follow you up, give you a quote, and, and, and show up. And want right? your business. Yeah, mm. not many 22-year-olds, like Adam said prior, are looking at setting up a cleaning business. It's an ugly, not fancy, right, non-sexy style business. Everyone else wants to start online businesses, drop shipping, you know, the AIs, these, these, like you said, sexy businesses. And you've got this 22 year old kid in my mind, right now setting up $3 million worth of reoccurring revenue. And it's refreshing. And totally. to be honest with you, like La Luna, Cali Beach Club guys, these guys are some of the most popular um, hospitality, hospitality of venues on the Gold Coast. I'm so they're not I've small made, operations. I've known Pat since he owns Gennari. I've known Pat since he started his first little restaurant in Broadbeach. Oh, yeah. And him and his wife at the time would be on the floor hustling. And I've, known, I've seen him go from there to where he is today with, I think, nearly 500 employees here on the Gold Coast. Mm. I know that he would be super impressed to have somebody like you walk in. So, yeah, but yeah, I, do, I do just want to... Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, I think another important point is you can obviously sell. You left school at 15... Where did you learn to sell? Is yeah, it, and, and just it, doubling it, down on that, that's where I was going to go, is that for people listening to this, I've done what you're talking about, knocking on doors, cold on the Gold Coast. It is terrifying. Mm-hmm. Mm. So how important was that sales role and learning to sell to do that? Because the average person, that is scary. Were you scared and, and how important was sales training? Yeah, I think that sales training is very important. And yeah, I was, I was scared, especially being young as well. Um, But a big part of it, like you can, and that's the thing too, like you can train all you want. And I've read a lot and a lot of books on sales, uh, which helped, you know, a fair bit. But the biggest thing is just doing it. You know, Mm -hmm. you just got to get those reps in. You just got to keep, keep at it. Like there's times that you wake up and it's like the, the least thing that you want to do in the world. Like, you know, like 
you, you, you'll be dreading getting out of bed and going and knocking on doors and talking to random people. But you just got to do it, you know, and you just got to keep putting those reps in and just remember why you're even doing it in the first place. That's a big well, thing. You've got 2.8 million reasons why now. <laughs> exactly. When I was exactly. Just a little bit yeah. younger than you, I actually worked for Kirby Vacuum Cleaners in yeah. Logan. Yeah. So that we had our sales meeting every morning in Logan. The suburbs of Browns Plains, Logan, Waterford West, all of those sorts of areas. And, they, and, and we used to drive out to Ipswich and we'd have our G up meeting yep. and, and, and then they'd load us into vans and we'd go door knocking to try and um, sell vacuum cleaners. Mm. And, uh, and the, I, the funny thing about it was every door we knocked on had a vacuum cleaner that worked perfectly fine until we basically scammed them into thinking that it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, 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 you know, that was not scammed them, but you know, there was ways that they did demos. But that, 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 um, that experience of you know going up to doors, being told to fuck off fairly regularly, um, and just keep going was really foundational in building the confidence to. And you'll take you'll take those sales skills like like you still have a lot of those skills now, right? Oh and, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing too. Like if you just practice and you learn the skill, you will carry it forever. You know? yeah. Yeah. Just had yeah. a story jump to mm -hmm. mind, which is just a funny sidebar. Yeah. yeah. People often ask, what was the funniest thing that ever happened to you when you were door knocking? Like, because you see everything, especially when you're door knocking on uh, doors in Logan. And <laughs> one day I knocked on a door, this little girl comes to the door, she was like three. And I said, is your mummy home? She looks up at me, she goes, nope, she's doing a poo. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Come back later. Okay. Who's at the door? And then the, the, the girl comes out and, and I was like, oh, how are you doing? You know? So uh, door knocking is a fun experience. Zeke, where does your confidence come from? Because this is a big thing, right? I, I want to know where does it come from? Because not a lot of people have the confidence to do what you've been doing. And once you answer that question, What's a tip that you could give some of the viewers on how to increase their confidence? Because a lot of it does come to having the confidence to get out of the comfort zone. And in this scenario, obviously door knock. Mm, I, think that, I think that you have to have, me personally, like I always just had, I've, I had really big goals, which kind of, which would not let me feel like I couldn't do something, you know? And I think that that's very important. Um, as well but i think that the main thing that you have to do is set big goals obviously but then also um build systems that and put pr put processes in place that allow you to not um not slack off you know and like you got to eliminate stuff and it's hard like living in a place like the gold coast you know you've got parties going on everywhere and stuff like that but like for a good period of my life 12 months like pan will attest to it like i did nothing but work you know and um, in hindsight, you know, like I'm, like it got me where I was, you know, but I think a big thing is eliminating distractions and just to answer the question about confidence is just set big goals and then, yeah. you know, you'll have the confidence because you have something that you're driving for, you know. The, it's, ama that, go ahead. Go on, sorry. it's amazing you say that, eliminate distraction, because I try to get Sam from Early Bird in one of my properties in Burley Heads right, because he was looking for a rental at the time, and he's like, there's no way I'm living in Burley Heads because I don't need a distraction. <laughs> I'm going to live somewhere far away from the distraction distraction, because I just need to work. This is a 22-year-old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. That's why James lives in Burley. I'm call it a distraction. distraction. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's more tail there than bloody RSPCA. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, just on that, you said about building, <laughs> building, building systems and, um, uh, and whatnot. You know, when you build it, you have, you've got a few team on now overall? Yeah, 45. 45. I was going to just dive in that question for a minute about clients and churn and systems and whatnot, because in that uh, trade, I know I've got um, some, uh, some familiarity around um, um, cleaning companies who do it to buying a few. And um, the churn um, and keeping staff and team and team building. Someone is 22. I mean, you might have read a few books on team building as well. To keep the staff of 45 on without them churning consistently must be a hell of a time because a lot of the um, uh, um, uh, um, labour that I was um, came across in, in these companies was often um, pretty transient people. Yeah. Um, a lot of um, off offshore people. So be keen to hear how that works. Yeah. So. Churn is a big thing, I think, in a lot of high labor companies. Like, like you said, we 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 tend to be pretty decent. Like, um, we don't have super high churn. We, like, a lot of our guys have been with us for since we started. Um, but, like, 
a big thing a big thing with with me personally from my perspective is like I've always really tried to it's like I've got this lack of because I'm young like just to give you context well I'm I'm probably I think I'm the youngest in my company you know I think we have one cleaner that's 19 so I'm the second youngest in my company and I have um I so for this lack and like I guess even like a bit of an insecurity you know I've always thought like oh you know how are they going to listen to me I'm younger than them you know and so like I've always focused on you know reading uh, leadership books and developing my leadership skills just so I can try and lead by example and, and be the best boss possible and I think that that has definitely contributed how does that show up like do you get in there on the tools in front of them and do you what sort of things do you actually do that when you say demonstrate leadership yeah so I, I, I try and still stay as hands-on as I can like it, it gets harder as you get bigger obviously um, to be touching every single um, cleaner and site um, but the big thing is like we, we all we do a, a weekly meeting with the team um, and just go over everything um, but again it's it's just like not asking them uh, like I don't tell them to do anything that I wouldn't do as well I'm not like this this young guy that just drives a nice car and comes in and just barks orders at him you know I try to always be genuine and humble when I'm talking to them as well um, and not talk down to them you know and people respect that you know at the end of the day mm. Mm. I, want, I just wanted to go back a step and, and touch on the having big goals and, and maybe another way to, to, to view that is passion. Uh, if I could tell a little story, when I got my first sales associate job, someone gave me a tip once. They said, when you don't get a job, you should ask why you didn't get a job. But you should also, when you get the job, ask why they hired you. It's really instructive to find that out. And I asked my boss at the time, you know, why did you hire me? And he said, well, he goes, I've got four quadrants, right? And it was, it was between you and another guy that was market knowledge, property market knowledge, and you were 70%, he was 80%. And then there was industry knowledge, and he'd been in the industry before, and so he was like 100%, and you were 40%, because you don't know much about the industry. And then there was sales skills, and you've never had a sales job, so you are probably about 60, and he was maybe 85, right? He said, but the last quadrant was passion. And he goes, you were off the charts 110%, and he was maybe at a 75. So goals, passion, can you talk us through that and, and tell us, you know, what are these goals? How do young people out there who, who don't have goals, how do they set them? Yeah. How do they get inspired? Just talk us through that a little bit more because I think Great that's question. really powerful. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, I, it, it's, it's a hard question for me to answer to be like, how should people set goals? Because I don't know why some people have bigger goals than other people. You know, maybe it's something that you're born with or, you know, maybe it's due to some sort of insecurity that you have within that makes you want to push. But for me personally, I always had big goals because like, I felt like when I was, when I first started like in business and I was reading all these books and everything, I just felt like I was in so much pain of me not being successful that I would do whatever it takes to get there. You know what I mean? And I think that that's what really drove me in the beginning and made me so passionate, made me so driven, made me want to work weekends, work all the time is because I had this thing that I was like, me not having a big company w was causing me so much pain, which might not be a good thing for some people. So that's why I don't want to suggest that, but I don't know what, what that, where that comes from. But How do mm. you set goals though? Do you sit down over yeah. a coffee once a year or what do you, what's your process for setting goals? And maybe you could share a couple that, that, that you've got right now. Yeah, yeah, so I, I like to write my goals out at the moment, I went a bit off track, but now I've been writing them every morning and every night. Wow. Yeah, so I, um, for like the first year I did that every morning and every night, but then I stopped, but now I'm doing it again, so I'm trying to get clear. So um, I think that it's important to set big goals, like think of what you can achieve and then like double it, you know what I mean? And well, Grant Cardone says 10 exit. 10 you know? exit, yeah. <laughs> That's actually a good book yeah, for just yeah, that is. challenging your thinking, can especially you when you're young because you've got so much time. Yeah. So can you share some of the, yeah. some of the goals? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so every goal that we've set for New Era or I've set for New Era, we've always like s surpassed it by a fair fair amount. So this year, I want to by the end of the year, we want to have ten million in annual recurring contracts, and wow. I think that that is quite doable. So, well, so ten million. What else? Some something else on the goals list? Uh, personal. Yeah, I want I want to travel a little bit more. We're me and Pan are going to Thailand. Um, next week now so i'm gonna travel that's this is my first holiday since i started yeah. it so yeah. i want to do that as well um 
and yeah, and just enjoy life and just ha- enjoy the freedom of, you know, not having, like being your own boss and not working for someone else. So. You, you mentioned pain before and you mentioned freedom now. I think, I think pain is a huge motivator for a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, you know, it's not always the biggest motivator, but it, I think it's often a, a huge motivator. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So yeah. what are you going to do, like, to get to 10 million? What does that involve? That's a, a 4x. Um, in, in a year. I love young people. Their goals are so freaking <laughs> ambitious. So, so you, I'm not saying you can't do it. Yeah, I'm just yeah, saying yeah, yeah. when you get older, you tend to sort of just like calm the fuck down. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm, of like, I'm, I'm just going to wear, you know, but it's awesome. So what are you, you going to do to get to 10? Yeah, so we're hiring, um, we're bringing on a BDM now. We had a BDM last year, but he left, um, which in hindsight was kind of a, a good thing. Uh, because now we're bringing on a really experienced BDM that's going to bring a lot of relationships and contracts. That's a business yeah. development manager. Yeah. You yeah. said something very interesting and key there. Somebody that brings a lot of relationships. Relationships, so yeah. So you're hiring their network is what you're saying. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. definitely. So this is somebody from the industry? They're from a different industry, but they have, it's similar, yeah. They have contacts into Same your target client market. base. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really smart for those people listening. And because uh, when I was young, this it seems obvious when you say it now, when you hire somebody, hire who they know. Mm. But when I was young, I wasn't smart enough to pick up on that. So that's really smart. So you're hiring a BDM and yeah. what else are you doing? Um, so me personally, I'm trying to um, still do the sales side of things as much as I can. Um, I'm also working with, I hope, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but um, I've got, a, I've got a, a new mentor and he's helping me out a lot. So um, I won't say his name specifically, but he, he built and sold one of the largest cleaning companies, exactly the same as me in Australia. Oh, mm-hmm. great. By the time he was 28. So he's, he's got a lot of experience um, and he's bringing a wealth of, wealth of knowledge as well. And he's pretty confident we can get there as well. So yeah. Um, that's so, so what's the plan with New Era longer term? So yep. Uh, is it to build it to 10 and flip it or are you going to keep going or what's what's your overall goal? Yeah, so, I mean, I don't have any intention to sell it. I'll just keep growing it. But, I mean, everything's for sale at the right price, right, at some point. If I get offered a, an amount or I want to change my goals or something, I might sell it. But for now, it's just to grow it. Um, you know, I'm young. I've got a lot of time. So I just want to utilize it the best I can. Yeah. So can you talk to us, like, I know uh, we talked about this a little bit off camera. When I was your age, <laughs> they used to print a magazine. Imagine that, right? Um, <laughs> a magazine called the BRW Rich List. And um, all entrepreneurs used to rush out. James, you were probably one of those back when the printing presses existed <laughs> with me. Definitely. And um, <laughs> it was published once a year in a printed form. And that was really the only time you got to see a billionaire. You never heard their voice. You never rarely see them on TV. They were these mythical figures. Um, but one thing I, as I got older I learned um, was that, uh, that a lot of the stuff that you were reading in the media was kind of just this heroization bullshit version of what it takes to be successful in business mm. and the reality of doing what you're doing like i keep looking down here and and i see 17 months in my world at 50 after being a business for 30 some years 17 months is like a nothing it's like it's yeah. like honestly it's just a blink mm. and uh, when i started business today i recently sold um a, a little business last week and i said to the person it was a startup I won't go into details, but I basically said, look, the person who's going to buy this, don't expect to make any money for the first year at all. You'll make a little bit maybe in the second year and third year, it should make some good money. And, you, and by that time, you'll probably you know, do quite well. Um, and that's how I talk about business, right? Mm-hmm. So I look at 17 months and I'm like, man, this is amazing. But what is it? it, it anyway, get into the story of the rich list. I used to read this and it used to mess me up because as a young person, I'm like, I look at this guy and he's like doing 2.8 million a year. And because there was no nuance around the story, I would think you're actually making 2.8 million a year. Mm. Yeah. But it's not like that, right? Like when you start from zero and you're hiring new people every month to ca- keep up with growth, um, you're not really but probably making a huge amount of money in those early days. So talk us through that. What has it actually been like to live through? And maybe we should have ripped pan, pan in here. Because, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but, but what has it actually been like uh, from a cash point of view? What has been the actual real world reality of building that? Yeah, yeah. So traditionally, commercial cleaning companies they're low margin um, businesses. Like, um, I think, like I haven't found a, the best resources, but from what I've looked at, the average cleaning company makes between five and ten percent net 
which is which is crazy. Pre-tax. Right? Pre-tax. Yeah. So if you turn yeah. over a million dollars, between fifty and a hundred grand profit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Most, but we're we're a, a fair bit higher than that. Um, but then again, that's get, a lot of it's getting reinvested back into the business over like, I would pay myself a very small salary, um, but to begin with I would, but then a big thing for me is like, I'm always, like you said, reinvesting in the team. So to get to the point where we're at, obviously we've had to sacrifice a fair bit of profit. And, and yeah, BDM yeah. coming in, right? That, that's not going to be cheap to get a good BDM. No, they're expensive. Yeah, they're yeah. expensive, right? That's a six figure hire, I'm guessing. Yeah. yeah. Six figure hire. So what you're doing is you're taking your your base. I'm imagining you're living off a pretty lean reality while you build this equity of the business. Mm. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. More it's, these days, but for the for the beginning, it was yeah very lean. Yeah. 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 That's good. Mm. And I and I want everyone listening to hear that because one of the things that's so critical in becoming successful is that starting the journey with real expectations. And if you're going to go out there and you look at Zeke and go, oh, this is great. I'm going to be making $2.8 million in yeah. two years. No, you ain't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Eric, uh, Mark, he's at $4, four million or whatever it is now with your Amazon business. I'm sure a lot of the money along the way was going to grow. James is the same. Eric went without for a decade before he got to $100 million in sales where you are now a year. That was, re, you know, you went without a lot of shit for a long time. That, that's the reality, right, guys? Like mm. uh, a lot of... People see these, you know, big ticket numbers, but they don't see the nitty gritty on what's actually what it actually takes to grow a business. The G wagon for and you came when? Oh, uh, fourteen years yeah, or twelve years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twelve yeah. or fourteen years of After, driving around yeah. in a shit bucket, and then he finally gets yeah, just reinvesting the back G-Wagon. into businesses is, and different. And now is the so. is the plate G spot on the way? No, not yet. No, <laughs> <laughs> Are you banger? no. <laughs> just put your glasses on and look left, mate. I think you're fine. Yeah. Yeah. You might look at it. You might see a G banger if you look on the map. Especially one other question here: when you're building out, and um, um, two or two, que- two questions in there. I mean, if you are your teams all um, you know, um, uniformed and you're you're supplying the vehicles and all that sort of stuff like that, or are you running a light asset model? So our um, so we our cleaners they drive their own cars. Got it. Um, so we don't supply them with vehicles, but. Uh, our so we have client service managers. We have one at the moment, but we'll be growing them. Yep. Um, and then we have operations manager, and so they both have cars. Sure, sure. Yeah. So you're bootstrapped at the moment. There's no debt at all. No debt. No. Or we have finance on our cars. A couple of cars. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, that's for probably the smartest way to do it. Yeah. Anyway, I, I got some uh, yeah. some questions um, in regards to around this touch point you mentioned before around pain. Now. I did a little bit of digging. I like to ask these tough questions. Okay, I'm you ready. Know, and, and getting people in vulnerable situations. <laughs> yeah. Especially when you were in those shorts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that well, this guy, guy here, buddy. Adam's always vulnerable when I wear these shorts. <laughs> <laughs> now, you don't look like you're wearing pants from this <laughs> I'm glad my eyesight's failing. I did a little bit of digging and uh, I seen an article and I want you to touch on this article. And the title of this article says it all. The time I almost lost it all. Yeah. So I want to, I, I've read it. I don't know if the boys have done enough digging like I have. Yeah. <laughs> but wow. tell me. Yeah. So is this article about Zeke? Zeke, yeah, it's about Zeke, yeah. I, it's an I article think I wrote that, that, that he LinkedIn. wrote yeah. that yeah. I, I have found through his LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, I know James would have found it for sure. Um, but anyways, yeah, the time I almost lost it all. Can you explain this story, please? Yeah, yeah. So there's been a couple of those times <laughs> over the course of the last couple of years. Um, that time specifically though was due to me um me, me budgeting money wrong and allocating resources wrong um and i'm not gonna lie i've done that a couple of times and it's almost put us um you know out of business and i think like and just to give everyone that's listening context as well like i, I never did the cleaning myself i would do it at night like occasionally if i wanted to but because I was so focused on growth, I was always mm. hiring. Right? But then it got to the point where that was detrimental because like in this occasion, I hired someone to handle operations. So I would do, so I got like a couple of child cares in Corumban and I had cleaners on their cleaning. And then I was still doing the operations and sales at the same time and doing a bit of DoorDash as well. Um, and at this point I brought a, 
Um, at this point, I thought, you know, I'm going to get someone part time that's going to take over the operations, and then I can focus on sales. I'm going to grow even more. And then I actually brought him on, and then I realized like two months later that we were we were losing money, and it was because of this hire. And um, at this point, I was paying myself a little bit of, out of the business as well. So what I did is instead of and this is that growth mindset, right? Instead of cutting him off, I said, oh, I'm gonna cut my salary, go back to door dashing more and just go even harder in the sales so we can get more sites to continue to grow. But there was a point where we were like down to our last bit of money and I was thinking like, we're gonna have to shut the doors. But luckily um, I had that door dash back up and I was doing that and then I could reinvest back in. So just to reiterate that, <clears throat> if, if you missed that, and I'm gonna read this paragraph. So it said, I had misbudgeted and hired way too quickly. From here, I figured the obvious option would be to let my CSM, customer services manager, I'm assuming, go so I could save costs and focus on rebuilding losses. After some thinking, it then came to me, not only did this option seem unfair on him, but it would feel like a huge step backwards as I would have to go back to running the operations, which would ultimately lead to a decline in sales for the business. Mm. And this is the big one. So I decided to lower my salary, do some cleaning at night myself, and keep my customer service manager on. This allowed us to get through and evidently proved to be a good choice. Yeah. Like that's heavy, right? Yeah. Like you, yeah. you're actually sacrificing your own lifestyle, your own salary to make the best decision for the business. And this is what I always say to everyone. It's not about yourself and business. The decisions you need to make that will make change in your business need to be for the business, mm -hmm. not for you personally, not for someone else. The business is number one and all choices need to uh, be um, made with that in mind. I'm, I'm a big believer in that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. good on you for doing that. At 22, yeah. I honestly, at 22, my 22 year old self would have sacked the CSM and kept my wage. Yeah. At that, like my mindset mm -hmm. back then. So yeah. good for you. No, thank you. I appreciate that. And just you just reading that back just gives me chills to th thinking about that time because um, like even when I was writing that article, it didn't hit home as much as you um, reading that. But there was there's a lot of times like that, you know, like where you really have to put the business first and sacrifice your lifestyle. You know, you guys would know. You what, know? what was the mm. turnover roughly at that time? Just out of interest. Um, I, it would have been like 20,000 a month max i reckon yeah it wasn't much but yeah but, but at that time for a 22 year old 20 grand a month sounds amazing right yeah and here you are not too proud to go on doordash mm. i love that mm. i think that's such a, a valuable point that you you've brought up eric i mean oftentimes as entrepreneurs especially when we're starting out we take on the failures as our own failures and that's because we're personalizing the experience we're, we're thinking about ourselves but when you put the business first and you think about the business you get through all that garbage and you just make the best decision, right? Yeah. And, and where others, yeah. you know, I've quit many times at that point when I was younger. So, you know, congratulations to you. It's, it's incredible. And, and you look at that and it's, all you did was miscalculate labor costs. So not understanding the so, numbers behind the business. You've got all this work coming in the door. You've got the right intentions. Hmm. So what have you put in place now to understand the numbers in your business? Yeah. So, if, so I'll, I was, I was going to answer that and say, you should see our, our backend systems now they're like <laughs> they're, i've got like everything like we just brought on this new bookkeeper that's um like basically rebuilding our whole back end and i'm like i have to let go a little bit and let her take a bit of the rain um so ha but, yeah. ha having this mentor that sold one of the largest cl uh, cleaning companies in australia would have to give you a hell of a lot of confidence when you go i've oh, fucked up here's a problem what's the playbook kid to go brush off page 192 let's do that yeah. that, that yeah. would be the utmost of uh, security if i was sitting in your spot for sure and it de-risks it de-risks you right because you're totally. like yeah he's been there done it yeah. all before there's not much you can fuck up yeah. anymore in, yeah. in cleaning than he's already done it like that is so totally industry specific that that thing you said about a bookkeeper I think bookkeepers are the most undervalued uh, and most important aspects of business. Like with every um, venture that Eric and I fund now, one of the first meetings is we talk about what we call the plumbing of the business and the plumbing and the foundation. 
So the plumbing and the foundation is how does money, what needs to happen in order for money to find its way into the bank account, which is okay, we need a bank account, we need a credit card processor, we need afterpay, we need all these things. And then the foundations, we need to make sure we've got a killer bookkeeper with the uh, chart of accounts set up correctly, all the expenses uh, itemised correctly, all the income separated out so we can see where the money coming from, specifically down to service or product level, and where the money's going, specifically down to product and service level. And most people don't do that. They just go, oh, we'll get a bookkeeper when we start making money. Yeah. Bad idea. Get a bookkeeper from day one. The first hire should be the bookkeeper, in my opinion, yeah. and interview to get the best. We've got some and killer bookkeepers the, now. But so the key word there is killer yeah. bookkeeper because they're, yeah. they're, not, they're not all made equal. It's, not, one of, no. it's one of the biggest reasons that small businesses fail is because they're, they're growing, but they're not making money. A good yeah. bookkeeper, like I've got two women that work for, for me in the family office, and they are awesome. Mm. Like, and they, they, they're both a little bit older, They've seen a lot of businesses come and go, mm. and that's what you need, guys listening at home. A book, a gun bookkeeper is critical, and then an accountant. But if you've got the right bookkeeper, the accountant's job's much easier. Much easier, yeah. And that's something that we, we skimped, like I skimped on for a long time, and it cost me tens of thousands of dollars. Like we would do, and like we always had a bookkeeper, but I would always offshore it to the Philippines or try and save costs where I can. Mm -hmm. But like now I pay my bookkeeper really well, and Man, the headaches it saved me, when the money hire, it saved me is yeah. crazy. Like, both I wish the, I did it from the beginning. The girls I hired, they're both Gold Coast girls, yeah. and I insisted on them being Gold Coast girls. Mm. I won't. I think Lizzie, who works for me, I think Lizzie is probably getting close to seventy, mm. but she has the mind of a twenty-one-year-old. She yeah. loves her job. She's a gun. She's a weapon. Like she'll text me and, "Hey, just Adam, did you remember to do this or that?" And that it's so important. Mm. It's it's one of those things. I hire a bookkeeper local because I want to be able to sit down with them once a month, eyeball them, and uh, but it's for the extra f couple of grand or whatever it's going to cost you a year to have a Perfect. local person that, that speaks your language, you know. Uh, Eric, you look like you wanted to say something there. Um, just thinking back to, so $10 million, Yeah. what does that put new Eric cleaning at? What, what does a $10 million business look like in your world? Um, in, in what regard, just like in how general. many employees, yeah. how much money are you making, how much, how much money, are, yeah, how point. much profit is, what are you doing with the profit? Yeah, so it would probably be, it would be 120 staff, I reckon, total, um, more potentially. Um, one, 120 full time, like on the ground. Um, but the pro profit wise, I would want to be doing between one and two million at least. Um, but where, at the moment, we're investing more into the real estate side of things. Um, that's where a lot I'm spending a lot of my time as well. Um, so doing end of lease cleans and getting relationships with the big uh, companies like Ray White and stuff like that, which Property I mean, management. that's residential, really. I still kind of consider it commercial because we're, we're working with the property managers and the, the companies themselves. Um, but we've just started, um, I guess, kind of like a residential sector where we do that, um, which is seeming to go well it's a lot that's profitable as well which is good um but so dependent on the goal would probably be to be honest would be like that one to two million dollars in profit and then the revenue might differ depending what industry we're in at that point and just keep it at that point and grow to the next stage yeah i know i could imagine it would slow down after that 10 million a little bit wouldn't so it says here in, in fast company uh, sorry smart company you want to be the biggest in, in Australia, where, where would you have to get to, to to tick that goal off the list? Yeah, we would have to be, and like, to be honest, since that, since that, like that article was a little, probably four months ago, I've looked, I've reevaluated our business and everything. And the goal is definitely to still be, um, you know, I would change that from the biggest to the best, you know, because Cause big isn't massive, always good. Yeah, yeah. You know, like you look at those big companies are making 5%. Yeah. yeah, profit. Like, what's the point of even running a company that big if you're not making any money? And I, I know uh, one of the big, uh, you know, the house and land builders, one of the the, the display builders. Um, not going to mention which one, but one of the guys who runs one of the biggest in Australia said the best time was when we we're only doing 400 homes a year. That's when we we're most profitable. Yeah. Now they're doing, you know, how many thousand or whatever, and running on margins like five percent. Mm. James, you were going to say. Oh, I was just going to say. Look, um, come, come back to that mentor. It just keeps ringing out um, to me as well. Like when you're doing your, your goal setting and what's your five, ten, five year, ten year projection look like? I mean, the guy's got the playbook to get to X. 
Um, so it'd be interesting to work out what that number was. Yeah, yeah. Well, and he grew. Well, you'll like this, James. He grew through acquisition a lot. So that's mm, in the playbook. Smaller. Yeah. So that's in the playbook as well in the future as well. Got it. Yeah. I don't know the specifics of that yet. Um, he, he does. We have, he does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you pay for this mentor? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. It's it's not a lot, but yeah, I pay for him. We meet uh, for two hours once a month, just go over everything. Um, he's very busy. He's running other companies, so. How valuable is that two hours? Oh, I would pay so much more than I do for it, you know. Just you can edit, 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 edit that beat out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, but the thing is, like, he, and he said to me, like, he believes in the company and what we're doing, you know, and so he wants to help out. As he much believes as in you. Can. Yeah. And does he do mentoring or did you, did you just hit him up and, and say, hey, mentor me? Like, how did... How did so he doesn't do uh, mentoring, no, because he runs other companies. Mm. Um, so... He, I got introduced to him through someone that I know from Brisbane and then we just kind of linked up and then I reached out to him on LinkedIn and he said, yeah, I think we can make something happen. So, awesome. yeah, good. Yeah. Good for you. Mm. Mate, it's a great story. We can't wait to see what uh, unfolds in the next little bit of time with you. Please um, keep us abreast of developments because it's just so good to see a local young person come up. You moved to Sydney, as you said, from, it was from Sydney, wasn't it, or Central Coast? Uh, Central Coast. I say Sydney because I say Central Coast. People yeah. look at me like they don't know what I'm talking about. But you about. came up yeah, here and yeah. you've really just focused. South East Queensland, what a place to set up. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. It's growing, yeah. right? And mm. and for young people listening to this, we think it's a great corner of the world because it's got all the things that you might want, but not quite as much of the distractions as, say, a Sydney or Melbourne. Mm. Um, I was speaking to the guys from High Smile and they said that they would not leave the Gold Coast because go to Sydney or Melbourne for that exact reason. Mm. There's just too much distraction. We want to stay here. That I think they're on their way to a billion dollar company just and they're a little bit older than you yeah um, yeah that, that story is crazy hey the, yeah the I used to live right next door to him like he was oh, in the next I would come home and his was the next door yeah and he's young and respectful and just such a nice young man mm. and um, seeing that story unfold but there's more and more of those stories you're you're an example here. I mean at two million what I would say and I think all of us would say to you is you're so early man like 17 months there's no reason you can't take this 20 million cleaning has just got such a massive tam mm, uh, to, total it. addressable market yeah um and the limits will be what's going on in here for you um that that game is as big as you want because i know myself um having experienced that there's a lot of room for improvement mm. and a young entrepreneur coming in looking at it through business eyes um there's a huge opportunity there and we, every one of us on this panel loves non-sexy businesses, and this is a non-sexy business. Um, and we wish you every success, mate. I think it's a great story. Mm. And for everyone out there listening, especially those young people and older people too, this is an example of why there really isn't any excuse. Literally, with a mop and a bucket and no money, uh, this guy was able to pick up the phone, put on the sand shoes, and carve out a nearly $3 million recurring business from nothing literally uh in less than two years i just love the story mm. um we wish you every success going forward and is, is there any is there anything that you would uh leave the audience with if someone's thinking about getting into business either 22 or even 44 yeah i think i think that just to wrap it all up thank you guys for having me on too it's a privilege to be here but i think that the there's like I'm a big proponent in, like you guys said, to boring businesses, old service businesses. Um, you know, there's so much room for improvement, especially being young. You know, you can even like the AI stuff, early bird stuff. Like you guys can, um, you know, improve on on these businesses. There's a lot of big companies that out there that just aren't doing a good job. So there's a lot of room for improvement. Yeah. All right, guys, quick reminder, if you want to get a free audit of your business, including you, because they, they, those guys could actually help you for, for, you know, really upside, go check our sponsor of today's podcast out, earlybird.ai, that's E-A-R-L-I, not a Y, earlybird with an I, earlybird AI. And if you want to join me and a busload of entrepreneurs in May, uh, May 13th to 16th, go to loveheart.org. Um, it's uh, uh, get your seat it's going to be a life changing experience and you'll meet some awesome people so um, thank you so much uh, both of you for coming in we always love to have the ladies <laughs> here as well we know how important your role is um, 
uh, in, in supporting a, a young entrepreneur. Uh, I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for my wife, and I'm sure all of these guys except James would say Great, the 100%. same thing. <laughs> <laughs> James is still down in uh, Burley being distracted. Um, but um, yes, so thank you as well um, for being there. It's a really critical part of the journey. Um, congratulations on your success, and uh, we'll see all of you guys next week. Remember, drop a comment below. Um, let, um, let him know what you thought of this uh, pod last week. We had 29,000 views in a week of last week's episode, wow. and we've had so many comments. Um, Tim was in Las Vegas after the pod, and he was reading the comments, and he was back with Eric going, oh my God, I can't believe how much this has affected people, because he's the most quietly spoken person in the world. Um, let uh, Zeke know as well, because these guys don't have to come on the pod. They do it because they want to share their stories. Give them some encouragement. Let him know what you learned from the day and tell your friends um, uh, to come and listen to the pod as well. Drop a comment, like, subscribe, James. Subscribe, yeah. subscribe, subscribe. Yeah, click on the bing and, and also turn on those notifications so that when a new pod drops, you get alerted. Uh, we really appreciate you guys. As always, thanks so much and we'll see you on the next pod. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Unemployable. If you'd like to watch another episode, just click there.